Welcome to FP&A Fast Track, your source for FP&A resources to put your career on the fast track. Welcome, everybody. I have a great guest today. I'm real excited. We met in person the other day, had a cup of coffee, got to know each other a little bit, but I really want everybody else to get to know Chad. Uh, he is a talent acquisition and executive search consultant with CoThrive. His clients range from Fortune 500 organizations to PE-backed tech companies and industry-leading consulting firms. And he's also co-host of the EPM Show, a podcast that gives EPM professionals an unfair career advantage. So first off, most of our listeners and viewers are probably in the accounting and finance space. So those acronyms will make total sense to them. But for those that don't, uh, tell us a little bit more about the people that you serve, private equity, enterprise performance management, what that means and how it plays out in your day-to-day -day life. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, John. You know, it's, it's fun being a, I love being a podcast host. So it's interesting being on the other side of it, right? As the guest. Uh, so we'll see how it goes, but yeah. So CoThrive, we specialize in talent acquisition, uh, recruiting mostly direct placement roles and uh, we've really niched into enterprise performance management. So that's your your software platforms, kind of EPM 1.0, SAP Oracle, um, Hyperion, NetSuite, and the like. And then 2.0, recently we've been doing a lot of work in the Anaplan space. Uh, so the the implementation partners that work with Anaplan, we, we help build their teams, staff their teams, and then the Anaplan customers that are ultimately the ones buying the licenses and, and using the software. We're helping them build out their centers of excellence and teams in, in, in that space. And then, you know, there's been all types of offshoots of that. We've been fortunate to work directly with Anaplan in, in many capacities, and we've expanded out into even technology go-to-market roles. So those alliance partner manager type positions, um, and then obviously working closely in finance still too. So it's a little bit of kind of just about what we do. And then enterprise performance management, for those who don't know, uh, that is anything from budgeting, planning, forecasting, any of those types of activities companies are doing, they're using software to do it like Anaplan, uh, Oracle, SAP. That's, that's kind of the general space. So how would you contrast those tools with traditional ERP tools, intersource resource, resource planning tools? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I think they're pretty, they're pretty relatable in many ways. Um, as far as EPM tools go, what we're seeing in, in, the, in the market now, it's mainly the, the type of delivery. Um, so it's on-prem versus like cloud software. So, so these tools like Anaplane, they're just much more dynamic um, in their capabilities and what they're able to do. Uh, the time to learn it and get upskilled on it is much faster. Um, so as far as usability goes, it's, it's much, much better. Um, but ERP and EPM are going to be very, very closely related. Okay, cool. So I want to ask you about something that might sound a little bit off the beaten path, but when okay. we talked the other day, the, the question immediately came to mind. So I know when you were in college, you wrestled. Oh yeah. And I'm a big fan of, uh, all kinds of different combat sports. Um, MMA, I guess, is the one that's most on my radar just because of its popularity. But I'm curious, I've heard a lot of people, a lot of athletes talk about how their sport has helped them in, in other areas of their life. And I think wrestling, from, from what little I know about it as someone who, who never wrestled, one of the things I keep hearing about it is the work ethic uh, that wrestlers have and how that has served them. So can you talk a little bit about how you think wrestling has helped you in other areas of your life, especially business? Yeah, absolutely. So just for the audience to have some context, I was started wrestling when I was, you know, middle school age was took to it pretty well, was fortunate enough to, to do well enough to, to get a scholarship wrestling in college, at North Carolina state and the ACC. Uh, and you know, it's, it's funny. Uh, wrestling has framed the bulk of my just view on business and the world. So to tell you a story, then I'll relate it back to what I do now. Um, when I came to NC State, we had a first year head coach. We were 66 out of 77 teams in the NCAA. So I mean, we were bottom of the barrel when when I tell you that. I mean, we were awful, terrible. Um, and what happened was new coach came in, 
set different expectations, created a new culture and brought in individuals who wanted to live by that culture and refused to accept the status quo, which was NC State's a bottom tier program. We said, no, NC State can be one of the best programs. And sure enough, in three years, we won ACCs and we climbed as high as number two in the national rankings. And so that taught me a lot about business and building teams. Number one, talent is key. And the attitude and mindset that that talent has, are they you know, ready and do they want to go out and achieve and, and win and, and gain market share? So, so much of it is attitude. Uh, and then I think the other piece of it really is, is culture and what type of a culture are you building? And so as a leader, we want to build a culture that says, hey, you know, here's the bar, let's go and get it. And you want to make sure that when you're challenging people to raise the bar, you need to provide an equal amount of support. So they have the resources and the tools that they need to get there. So, you know, honestly, the, the other piece of it too, is that wrestling is a sport where you can just, to put it plainly, get punched in the gut sometimes. You can do everything right. You know, you make one mistake and you get beat. Or when you're out there wrestling, it's 1v1. And if you get beat, there's no one else to blame. So it teaches you a ton of accountability. And I just think that in business and in entrepreneurship and, you know, career in general, it's about staying power power, and staying power is a byproduct of resiliency. And so for me, it's less about never failing and it's more about staying at it. And wrestling has taught me that. And I think the companies that, that are successful and the people that are successful, sometimes it comes down to they're, they're just the ones who are willing to show up for long yeah. enough in order to figure it out. So you mentioned mindset. Um, which I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in mindset as well. I was listening to, I think it was Stephen Bartlett on Diary of the CEO podcast. And he was interviewing Simon Sinek. They were talking about mindset. And he said that somebody else that he had interviewed has said that he viewed mindset as a privilege. And he thought, well, I'd never thought about that before. And I think the context was that people who come up with parents and sort of an environment uh, that teaches them a, a positive mindset and a growth mindset from an early age kind of sets them up with an advantage. So I'm curious, what would you say to people who might think, well, hey, you know, I didn't come from a background of people that talked about the importance of mindset. Um, I had a lot of negative people around me growing up. What would you say to someone like that about how they can, things that they can do to get themselves into the right mindset? I would say, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. So. If, if you didn't come up in that kind of a background or, or that wasn't the environment that you grew up in, think about the people that you know in your life. And when you say, man, I want my life to look like what their life looks like. I want to do what they're doing. Go make friends with them and go figure out how they think and, and surround yourself with those types of people. So I think it's part of it is starting with who in my life do I aspire towards? And then figure out how do I spend more time around them? Yeah, that's great advice. That reminds me, I think James Clear in his, uh, his book, Atomic Habits, talks about uh, getting yourself into an environment, becoming a part of a group of people who have values and habits that, that jive with what you, the habits you want to have and the values that are already consistent. And it kind of creates an accountability. For uh, sure. An environment it, of accountability. One hundred percent. You know, and the other thing too, like thinking about that practically. Let's say you're on LinkedIn, or there's people that you know that are just kind of your weak ties, for lack of a better term. You know them. You maybe have name recognition, um, and let's say maybe you make a list of, hey, there's fifty people that I just I see their career, I see where they're headed, and I aspire to them. Well, you need to reach out to all fifty, but only seven or eight of them might actually give you the time of day or respond. And of those seven or eight, maybe four, you can develop relationships with. So there's part of this too, that is, it kind of goes back to the resiliency piece of knowing like, hey, I, I need to just keep pushing forward and to keep pushing play. And I'm okay yeah. with realizing that I'm going to get mostly no's, but it's, it only takes one yes to make a significant change. Yeah, it's true. I'm curious, uh, you have an MBA mm -hmm. um, and, uh, I think it was Alex Hermosi that was talking about how he had, he did real well in undergrad and he was in the process of applying to the Harvard MBA program. And so he studied really hard. He did great on his GMATs. 
and he's filling out the application. One of the questions said something along the lines of, how do you believe uh, getting uh, into our program and getting a Harvard MBA will help you reach your short and long-term goals? And when he reflected on it, he thought it won't because he, he had desires to be an entrepreneur. So he didn't go into the MBA program and just started working on, on building a business. So I'm curious, what was it about getting an MBA that you saw would be a good thing to help you get to your short and long-term goals? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so for me, I actually went straight through undergrad to MBA and part of what okay. drove him comes back to wrestling. Wrestling drove that. Uh, I did a graduate transfer and so I was still competing and I wasn't going to do a second undergrad degree. So I decided an MBA was a better way to go and focus on leadership and management because I knew I wanted to lead. I knew I wanted to build things. I wasn't necessarily as technical. I didn't love computers and IT. I can do Excel, right? I can do analytics. I, I have the, the the table stakes, baseline skills from prior work that I've done, but it's not what it's not what gets me up in the morning. What gets me up in the morning is helping people and companies achieve their maximum potential. So I focus more on the leadership and the management track um, doing that. But to be honest, I kind of agree with Alex Ramosi. If wrestling hadn't just had guided me into that path. I don't know if, I don't think an MBA will, especially if you want to be an entrepreneur, because I can tell you since I jumped out and started doing this about this, I took the entrepreneurial route probably nine months ago now. And I've learned the, the most out of those last six to nine months than I have in my entire career leading up to this. And so part of it is just, you learn by doing, you learn by experience. I think yeah. the benefit of an MBA is, Sometimes it's the network that you can build and the people that you can get into a room with. That's a really good value. And it also depends, again, on what you want to do. I think if you want to be in the C-suite of a Fortune 500 company or launch a startup, then it's a great route. But if you want to maybe go the bootstrapped entrepreneurship route, sometimes the best way to get going is by rolling your sleeves up and yeah. failing and then figuring it out and then bailing again and then figuring that out and continuing to, to sharpen that way. So it sounds like, so you, through, through your graduate studies in the MBA program, you were still on scholarship for wrestling. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it sounds like wrestling has played a huge role outside of the, the specific skills that it taught you and the things that it taught you about life. It sounds like it, it has really affected you even directly um, yeah. with the educational opportunities. You mentioned table stakes, table stakes skills. So I'm curious from, from your perspective, especially being someone who does placement and, you know, you're dealing with kind of both sides of the table, right? You're looking at an organization and what are their needs for specific types of talent. And then you're looking at the people to fill those slots outside of the very specific technical skills of a particular job. What are some of the things that you see as sort of the table stake skills that a lot of people are looking for these days? Yeah, absolutely. That's a good question. So, I mean, I'll give you an example. We're working with a client right now that's hiring a regional vice president of sales. And the number one thing that those hiring managers are looking for, and by the way, that's the CRO. The number one thing the CRO is indexing on is resiliency. Interesting. It says number one skill set. And I think I sent this to you uh, before the episode, but one of the things I came across this week that really is kind of mind-blowing in some senses with everything that's going on right now, but it also makes sense at the same time. Uh, as the World Economic Forum released a report around the future of jobs, and in that report, it lists the top 10 skills that are going to be most in demand moving forward. And of those 10, eight of them are some type of a cognitive or self-management skill. Eight of the 10. Yeah. So only two of the 10 have anything to do with technical or hard skills. So some of those, some of those softer skills, like say soft, not because they're easy, but soft because they're harder to quantify, um, are analytical thinking, creative thinking, resiliency is number three, motivation and self-awareness is number four. That kind of goes back to someone who just wants it more and is willing to show up. Uh, another one is curiosity and lifelong learning. People who are willing to ask questions, learn new things, innovate, um, Attention to detail is another one. Attention to detail is a learned habit, right? That's a yep. learned habit that we can all continue to cultivate. Empathy is a top skill that's listed in this report. And then leadership and influence. The only technical skill sets 
are quality control and technological literacy that are listed in the top 10. So to answer your question, we've seen this play out practically, and then this data just confirms it. Companies are looking for people who know how to thrive and succeed in what we call a VUCA environment. That's volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. That's the world we I haven't heard that one in a while. Huh? I haven't heard that one in a while. It was a hot, it was a hot term for a while, and then it kind of died down. Yeah, but that's the world we're in right now. I mean, geopolitical yep. unrest, generative AI rapidly changing the way every job and task is done pandemic, everything, you name it, like people, yeah. companies need people who not just are able to do the technical things, but can actually thrive and, and maintain and sustain in a crazy changing world. So a lot of the things that you just mentioned are things that I focus on in the training that I do. And so it leads me to the question Let's just take resiliency. We could talk about a lot of them, but let's just take oh, resiliency. Yeah. Each one could be its own episode. <laughs> yeah. So how do you, in a, either a screening, a selection process, or how do you sort of assess somebody's resiliency when you're going through the process of selecting or, or filtering through or assessing people? I try, to, I try to figure out and ask questions around, tell me how you've handled failure. Tell me how you've handled adversity? What if things not gone wrong? How did you handle something that was unfair, right? What, what happened? How did you get back up? And then being able to not just ask them that, because people can give you the answer that you want to hear in that, but like, can I see it in their career path? Can I see like, Hey, this didn't work. And they rebounded. Not only did they rebound, but they accelerated as a result of that. So I think so much of it is around how people handle failure and if you're a hiring manager thinking about hiring, you need to be able to dig in there, right? And sometimes I, sometimes what I've seen is the people who have failed the most and continue to get back up tend to be some of the best team members because they're not afraid yeah. of the challenge. Yeah, you're reminding me of, um, actually, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this book, Never Split the Difference. I have not read that one, but it's on my list, actually. Excellent book. I highly recommend it. So Chris Voss, the guy that wrote this book, I became aware of him. He was speaking at a conference where I was also speaking. I got his book. He talks in that book about an example of how um, somebody asked him about uh, if he had ever lost a hostage in a negotiation. He was a, the head of the FBI hostage negotiation team mm -hmm. and taught all of their negotiators. And the guy in the interview asked him, have you ever lost a hostage? And he said, well, yeah, you know, we have a very high success rate, but we have lost them. It's like, well, did you think about quitting? He said, yeah, I did. But then I talked to my mentor and his mentor told him that he actually looked for people, tried to recruit people who had lost someone, who basically had failed and stuck with it because he found that they go one of two ways. Either the pain of losing somebody and, and losing in that, that work environment was so deep that they, could, they just didn't want to ever have that happen again and they quit. Or they doubled down and they said, I'm going to do whatever it takes to make sure that never happens again. And they just got obsessed with getting better at their craft. Um, yeah. And so he actually went out and he recruited those people. That's awesome. Yeah. One of the, one of the phrases that has stuck with me just throughout my life and career is you have a choice when, when you fail, face failure and adversity, you can get bitter or you can get better. Better. You yep. choose. And the people who, who, when they face failure or they make a mistake, and they just, they taste that nasty, awful feeling and that like just sinking in the pit of your stomach, but they choose anyway in the midst of that terrible feeling to, to double down and say, okay, what could I have done differently that would have prevented this outcome? And how do I make sure that it doesn't happen again? Or if it's possible yep. that it can happen again, how do I significantly decrease the chances? Yeah. And I think it gets back to that mindset too, right? And mm -hmm. When you have the right mindset, you kind of default to that type of thinking versus throwing up your hands and going, this was tough. I don't like how it feels. I don't want to feel it again. So I'm just going to remove myself from the equation. Mm -hmm. um, that makes me wonder about motivation. So Tony Robbins talks a lot about how everyone is motivated towards things that they want and away from things they don't want, right? And most people have a tendency 
to feel one more strong than the other. Like mm -hmm. I, I have realized I used to set goals and I eventually realized I was much more motivated by the fear of a negative than the, the promise of a positive. Do, do you know where you would land on that? Are you more motivated by not wanting to lose or by, by gaining something positive? That's, yeah, that's a good question. I'm guessing in wrestling, it probably came up like when you, whenever you might lose, yeah. hopefully very infrequently. Yeah. But were you more pissed off that you got beat or that you, you didn't move that one step closer to winning something bigger? You know, I think honestly, I'm motivated more towards okay. the promise of an towards. outcome than the fear of, of a failure, because I just, I don't believe that, that a failure defines me. Like, I don't think one singular event, one single failure, one missed opportunity defines me at all. Like, I don't think yeah. it impacts my, my intrinsic value. So I'm not yeah. as afraid of that. Um, whereas I am more motivated towards, you know, one of the things I was always taught was begin with the end in mind, begin with the end in mind. So like when you're going to go to a practice and it sucks and it's 530 in the morning or you're working till 10 PM because something has to get done or you're, you're getting up. I'm more of an early person. So you usually won't catch me working till 10 PM unless it's absolutely dire need, but you will catch me up at 330 in the morning, finishing whatever it is I need to get done. That's kind of, oh, wow. That's my like most productive time. When I really need to get things done is early, early in the morning. But you know, when that alarm goes off and I'm, you're getting up to to do something, and you're like, oh, I'd rather sleep. Like, what gets me out is is thinking about that end result that we're after. Um, and for me, that end result, it, it's not always. It's usually not actually like financial, but it's more around: Am I maximizing? my gifts? Am I maximizing my skills? Am I maximizing my opportunities? Like when I get to the end of my life, the end of my career, whatever it is, I want to be able to look back and say, I gave it everything. Like I left nothing on the table, independent of the result, because we can't control results. Like if we could all control a result, we'd all be multimillionaires. We just would, yeah. right? Like if you could control it, why would you not do it? Um, we can't control results. We can't control outcomes, but we can control effort. So yeah, I want to be able to look back and say, I gave it everything and I don't regret any of it. So talking about goals, one of the things when we talked the other day, you had mentioned that your company is, is uh, bringing somebody on to help with some of the expansion that you guys have in yep. your, on, on your horizon. If money were no object, let's say you had like twice the funding. Of, of whatever you have in your budget right now, what is something that you would do in your business to move you closer to your goal? Oh, that's a good question. If money were no object, what would we do in our business to move us closer to our goal? I think what I would do is I would launch just an incredible mastermind group, like live in person, you know, like those types of events. Like we would go all in on creating some really amazing experiences for people when they're trying to advance their career. That's probably what I would launch. Um, I'd be, I mean, that, I mean, you think about doing that at scale, like you have to hire tons of people. You got to have a ton of capital to be able to put those events on to front it. And there's a lot of risk involved because you need people to sign up. Um, but yeah, I, I, I just, I'm a big believer in us getting in the same room together, uh, at least, you know, for periods of time, sure. Like hybrid work, remote work. I love that too. I'm not saying it's not a good thing, but just like, I think people need to be able to take time and work on themselves and work on their career. And if we could facilitate something like that consistently across the country, I think it would, it would pay huge dividends because I mean, practically we would build one of the best networks in the industry by being able to add that much value to people. 
not an answer I had thought about. That's a, I hadn't thought about the question. So. <laughs> no, that's a really yeah, interesting. I, I, that's a, yeah. <laughs> but what I found interesting about it is I've never thought of, actually, I have thought about doing mastermind before, but I never thought about it enough to, to realize that how big of an endeavor that would be. It sounds like you've thought about it enough and, yeah. and thought through what would be involved in that. Oh, yeah. And like when I say masterminds, I mean, I want to have the cream of the crop facilitators. Like we wouldn't necessarily be the people who are doing it, but we're going to have the best of the best speakers, executives. Like, I mean, we would, we would pay Dude, Are you hearing fees. yourself? Huh? You, are you hearing yourself? You just said we're going to have like. Well, that's like, the plan. Like we would, <laughs> not like hypothetical. Hey, the idea has been generated. So here. I've uncovered something that, that's actually a, a plan already. In yeah. Oh, yeah. Mind. <laughs> okay. That's interesting. So you mentioned working on yourself. What are some of the things that you do to work on yourself? Yeah, that's a good question too. Um, I think some of the things I would do to work on myself, uh, I, I love listening to podcasts. I think it's one of the best ways just to get access to people and and. Listen, they can't, podcasts can't be everything. There's value in reading like Good to Great by Jim Collins, incredible book, uh, 8020 Principle, you know what I mean? Atomic Habits. These are, these are data backed, research backed books. Love all those. I think they are just some of the best tools and they're never going to, they're never going to, a podcast can never replace that. You know what I mean? But one of the things that, one of the benefits I've received from listening to a lot of shows is I feel like you just hear more real-time experiences from people and I'll talk a little bit more authentically when you have a long form interview around what they felt or what they experienced. Like one of my favorite ones right now is how I built this, which I think we've talked about before. Yeah. Um, but you listen to these entrepreneurs who have built crazy successful businesses, name brand companies that most people know about. And then you hear the story over the course of an hour of them telling from like, Hey, here's how I started. It was in my guest bedroom and this is what it was or you know the guy who started halo top ice cream did an episode and it started with like him wanting a healthier dessert and just putting it in a bowl in his fridge and how it went from that all the way to you know at one point one of the top selling ice cream brands in the country or orange theory fitness how you know the woman who started it was in her 50s and she starts it in the guest bedroom of her house and slowly grows and just through these like crazy, almost lucky moments happening, it just becomes what it becomes. And so it just, I, I walk away from those, those types of episodes and those stories with a lot of just reminders to stay at it and to, to realize that here's what it is actually going to take. And I find that to right. be a very, very good good tool for equipping me with the right expectations. Because if you expect something to be easy and then it's hard, you're more likely to quit. But if you expect yeah. it to be hard and you know what needs to happen because you've listened to someone talk about how they did it, then I think it just can set you up to, to persevere through things. But then, yeah, podcasts, um, love reading books. And I, I think the other thing too is always having people in your life who have done what you want to do. And can kind of guide you through that. So I'm always looking for mentors, leaders at companies that I can sit down with once a quarter, once a month, and just ask them questions or talk about, hey, here's what we're going through. Like, how would you solve this? Those types of things. So you just touched on something that's uh, it's kind of freshly on my radar, the, uh, the whole mentor thing. Who, who is someone that if you if you knew 100% they would say yes who is someone that you would ask to be a mentor someone i would ask to be a mentor if i knew that they would say yes that's such a good question um i would probably go with like james clear james clear okay yeah. big on habits yeah I, yeah, think, I, think, I think it all starts there. It all starts with like our personal productivity. And, you know, I'm also, I have to realize for myself, this is the thing that I've come to begin to think about. Like when, when, when I think about my goals of, hey, we want, we want our company to look like this one day, right? Who I am today has to change in order for that to be possible. Yeah. And so having a guy like him who can just evaluate 
habits and then think through, okay, well, these are the six habits that I have that are bad. How do I change these and take those steps? I think that's invaluable. Yeah, I love the way he breaks down the process so clearly and so simply, right? Mm -hmm. Like step by step, if you want to break a bad habit, if you want to start a new habit, you know, here's, here's a specific strategy on how to do it. Um, oh, yeah. Just really, and there's, there's been lots of other habit books way before his, but I, I think he's just done a great job of articulating in a way that's, that's really, really digestible. Yeah. His is, to me, it's one of the most practical ones because yeah. you walk away with like, like the, the number one thing I probably walked away from with that book is habit stacking. So if you mm. want to, if you want to implement a new habit, find one that you already do and then just stack it on top of that. So one for me is like, I read, I read my Bible almost every morning. It's one of my more consistent habits in my life. But when I want to read, I mean, I want to read more business book. Okay. Well, I'll read my Bible for 20 minutes and then I'll read a business book for 10 because that's my like carved out reading time anyway. And so being able to like got you. stack like that. Yeah. Super helpful. That reminds me that guy mentioned to you, Alex Ramosi, he talks about skill stacking. Okay. Yeah. Where Maybe the first skill you get is just math. You get better at math. Okay, that's one skill. Well, now maybe you add to that. Well, now I'm going to study accounting and I'll use my math skills to get better at accounting. Okay, so now I mastered. Well, now maybe I learned about tax, the tax code. And then maybe I learned about cost. Account. Now all of a sudden I'm stacking these skills where, oh, wait a minute. These are the skills that a good CFO has. Boom, like by stacking these habits that kind of naturally are related to each other, Mm -hmm. You're kind of baby stepping your way towards sort of a bigger picture goal, but you're doing it in a much more digestible chunk, kind of Absolutely. stacking it. Um, you mentioned something earlier about expectations. This is another thing I got from Tony Robbins about how more often than not, the reason that we experience negative emotions is not because of something that happens. It's because something violates our expectations. Mm -hmm. and, and I always use the example, when I was in college, um, my first, I think it was my first year or two at Florida State, I lived in this piece of crap mobile home. And I was happy to have it. You know, it was, it was really inexpensive. And I had a roommate. And it didn't even occur to me that it was a crappy mobile home. But now... At my stage of life, if I had to go back and live in that, my expectation is that I should have something different. It has nothing to do with the mobile home or the house that I live in now. It's all about my expectations. So I'm wondering, have you, has anything stuck out to you as an expectation that was violated somewhere in your life that caused you disappointment or upset that when you look back on it, you think that was a silly expectation anyway? John, one of the things I've learned about myself lately is I am like an unbridled optimist, which and that can be a great thing because I'm always looking at like, hey, what can go well here? You know what I mean? But the other thing I've learned is that I don't know who said this, but I think it's just more of maybe like a, a wise proverb. I don't know who to attribute this to, but it's you, you'll always grossly overestimate what you can do in a year and you'll grossly underestimate what you can do in five. So I, and I am, the king of that but i do think the challenge is being if you have if you realize that you've overestimated what you can do in one year being able to kind of like tailor your expectations back down to say hey it's okay if we didn't hit this crazy goal in year one but we got close and then to stick with it for four more years like that's the hard part right it's easy to say oh you you way overestimate what you can do in one year, but you underestimate what you can do in five. The hard part with that is sticking with it to year five. So that makes me wonder about, I, I, I also am a kind of a incurable optimist. And what I've always found ironic is people that know me a little bit, but not really well, sometimes have a misperception that I'm more pessimistic than I am because I'm constantly planning, mm -hmm. right? But I plan to protect the downside. And once I plan, then I can forget about it and not worry. So I'm curious, are you more of a planner or more of a kind of seat of your pants type of person when it comes to just life in general and nothing specific? I think it, I think it depends, to be honest. Um, I'm definitely not a perfectionist. It's not something that I 
tend to struggle with. I think in the past, I've been much more of a, like, I need to have this perfect plan in place, but making the jump into entrepreneurship, I feel like almost recently has kind of broken me of that because there's no way to like really plan when you're, when you're just starting out, like the goal is to admittedly stay alive. You know what I mean? Like that's well, the goal. And so, what I find, what I find interesting about planning is I think people that don't understand how I look at it, look at it like it's, it's much more rigid than, yeah. than I think it to be. And I've always said plans generally are fairly useless, but mm-hmm. planning is yes. invaluable. Yes. The process, forcing yourself to ask the questions and challenge assumptions, that's where the value is. Because totally whenever, I've, whenever I've done formal plans in the past, like I, I worked at jobs where planning was like in my job title, right? I worked in the planning department. We did budgets and all that, right? The second we would print that thing out, put it in a binder, it went on a shelf and no, nobody looked at it again because it was useless. We started focusing on, all right, now let's reforecast. Yep. The new information we have now, how do we think that's going to go? And then how do we adjust accordingly? Yeah, absolutely. I will say, so where, where I plan, because I, I'm not someone who's going to wake up and be like, okay, well, what am I going to do today? No, like we have, a, we have a plan in place. And, but where I plan is kind of along the lines of the 80-20 principle. Like 80% of your, your results come from 20% of your efforts. So our planning is around what is that 20%? Okay, it's these four activities. Well, I can show you my calendar right now. Every single one of those activities is time blocked five days a week. So that's kind of how, how I have approached planning in this journey so far, is that let me identify those critical activities that are going to produce the highest ROI. And we're going to make sure every piece of that is detailed out in terms of what we're executing on or what our goal is to execute on on a daily basis. You just triggered another, another memory for me, which was um, when I worked in planning at Arby's, one of the regional directors of operations that I worked with, who I looked up to, I just thought, he was, he just, he kind of had all his priorities in order, right? He had a big family and he was always on the phone coordinating family stuff, but he always got his work done, just motivated people really well. And he told me one time, when somebody tells me that something's important to them, I can tell really quickly if they're telling me the truth by looking at their calendar and their checkbook. Yep. If people spend their time and money on, that's where their priorities are. And if I look in their calendar and their checkbook, and it doesn't line up with what they're telling me. I know they're full of BS. Um, so I always looked at that as kind of to check myself, right? I'm, I might be able to look at somebody's calendar. I'm, in business, I can look at their checkbook because they're spending the company's money. That's kind of where he was right. coming from with that. Um, but even on a personal level, I've always thought about that. When I, look, when I look into my calendar, what I'm saying are my goals. Does my calendar actually jive with that? And, and am I spending money? on the things that I should be to get me where I need to be. Yeah, that's such a good reminder because I mean, at the end of the day, if you think about life, time is the most valuable asset anybody has because you can never get it back and you don't know how much you have. Hate that the truth. Um, so let's, let's get back to business for a second. Let's do it. Um, what is something about your industry or your profession that you believe is a miss that people misunderstand something about our industry that is a myth that most people misunderstand um so one of the things that i've started to realize is that I, so what, when you say my industry i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to think about that and contextualize that right now as Perfect. recruiting agencies so third yep. party companies that help other companies bring in talent either full-time contract to hire anything like that, but that third party agency. Um, one of the things, one of the myths that I've noticed when I work with internal talent acquisition teams is sometimes there's a little bit of this myth around like, oh, well, that agency is going to make me look bad because we brought them in because I wasn't able to do it or what have you. Um, whereas our goal and our approach in everything that we do is to make our talent acquisition partners look really good. Right. Like it's not about, it's not about co-thrive getting credit. It's about the outcome 
that the company's looking for, that the client's looking for, getting becoming a reality. And so I, you know, I think one of the myths that we want to change that we work really hard at changing is that there's this weird battle between internal talent acquisition and then the external partner that comes in. Whereas we want to be a platform that the internal team can stand on and trust and say, hey, we have your best interest in mind and we're here to make you look really, really good. That's the goal. Yeah. That whole idea of partnership you talked about, that's been something that for me, when I really started to lean into that has, has helped a lot in my business. I think I told you when we met the other day that I had a situation with a client where the, I was doing a training and, and things kind of just got disorganized and it, and it ended up kind of not, not working out the way I wanted it to work out. And it was the way I handled it that ended up being a big win, which was to simply just go back and say, look, we're in this together. I look at this like we're partners. Mm -hmm. What can I do to make it right? Mm -hmm. right? Something as simple as that, that and it, it's not business specific. I, I kind of look at, I try to be that way with everything, right? I mean, nobody's perfect. You right. can go to a restaurant and they could screw something up, but it's how, how do they fix it? Uh -huh. um, to me, that, that always um, is one of the big difference makers to me. Um, Yes, yeah, so you look like yes. Yeah, so no, I was just gonna. I was just gonna. I was just gonna echo that. Say I couldn't agree more. It's all about how you respond. So let's shift gears a little bit. One of the things in in my business that I am constantly trying to get better at, I think one of the the key communication skills is listening. Mm -hmm. And I think I've learned from kind of two separate buckets. One of the academic reading books and studying, and then just watching people who I think are good at it. Is there anyone? that stands out to you um, in your life, whether it's business, personal, doesn't matter, that you feel like has just shown themselves to be a really good listener? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, honestly, I'd say my business partner, Blake, just an incredible, incredible listener, incredible at repeating back in a way that doesn't just say, hey, I can regurgitate information for you, but no, I understand, right? Like, and part of, part of, part of doing that, I think is, is getting into underlying motivation that people have. So it's asking those follow-up questions, like the five whys is a really good, is a really good approach to take. And, yep. you know, so when someone's describing a pain point, well, like, why is that painful? Well, because of this, or, or why is that the way that it is? And being able to kind of continue to dig in to get to those underlying things and then, and then summarize everything and package it in a way that someone can say, yep, that's our problem. He's really good at that. You just hit on, I'm going to sound like I'm pushing his book, the, the Never Split the Difference book. I was sorry. He talks about, he calls it tactical empathy. Mm -hmm. And he refers to what you want to get from a person is some version of that's right when you articulate back what you think you heard, mm -hmm. right? That's like their way of saying, hey, you get, you're on the same page. You understand me. And it's that, that empathy piece where a lot of people, I think, misunderstand. It's not about feeling what they feel. It's about getting them to understand that you truly understand where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. And I think in business where, where I think people miss the mark a little bit is they, they think they have to feel what the other person feels or they have to agree with them or affirm them to, to, feel, to, to feel like they, they're giving them empathy. All they're looking for usually is just to be understood. You could totally disagree. Like in his example, he was negotiating with hostage takers, terrorists, right? Mm -hmm. He didn't agree with them. He didn't like them. He didn't want to have anything uh, in common with them, which is typically how people look to, to build rapport. But if they understand that you understand where they're coming from, uh, that goes a long way usually um, in, uh, in just establishing rapport. Um, so I want to ask you something about awareness too. Awareness is, it's another area. I think I told you, I, 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 won't, I won't waste everybody's time here because I've told this story a lot in different places, but I told you that story about when I worked at AutoNation yep. and I just realized I just had this big, like, you know, gaping hole of awareness. I just, you know, wasn't aware of both how I was coming across to other people and I wasn't aware of how, you know, them communicating with me. Are there any questions that you've asked yourself that have helped you become more or any habits you have 
that have helped you become more aware or stay in sort of an awareness mindset? Yeah, I, you know, I honestly think, I think journaling is a big one for me. Ooh. I journal a lot. And that's something I got to credit my wife to. She's a, she's a big time journaler as well. So it's kind of rubbed off, I think. And just being able to write down what you're, what you're feeling and why, and that like practicing that, like that's a muscle, right? Self-awareness is a muscle. Yeah. Just like, if you want to, if you want to have stronger legs, you squat. If you want to have greater self-awareness, you reflect. That's, that's just, yeah. that's what it is. Um, and so journaling is a really good way and an active way to reflect on, okay, what am I feeling today? Well, I have this low grade anxiety about X. Okay. Why? Right. And then just being able to kind of do that. But then also on the, on the other side of it, on the positive side, what am I grateful for today? Well, I'm grateful for this. And usually some of those things can help you handle, um, some of the negative things that might be going on, but it's kind of that literal action, both positively and negatively of taking stock, taking mm -hmm. stock of where you are. So do you, do you have a formal process that you use when you're journaling or do you just write down your it, thoughts? It, and... it shifts in seasons. You know, I'm not okay. going to position myself or make people think I'm one of those guys where I just, I'm like, I did, I did the same thing. I'm this highly systemized. Like there's been seasons where I've written down like, Hey, what are three things I'm grateful for today? What are three things I'm going to accomplish today that'll make today a success and things like that. And right. there's other times where I just go in and I just kind of write. Just do like a brain dump. Just a brain dump. Yep. Yeah. The reason I ask is because, you know, I'm, I've, I've been a personal development junkie for a long time. So I've heard it many, many times from people, successful people, right? It's, it's one of a handful of things that you hear consistently from really successful people, right? They get up early, they work, you know, they take care of their bodies journal, right? It's, it's one of the like yep. little commonalities. And so there was a, a stretch of time where I journaled and then I saw, I think it was Tim Ferriss was talking about how he did journaling. And I was like, oh, now I think I see why I lost motivation with journaling is I never stopped and went back and looked at my journals to reflect on them. Yeah. And he has this process and just, he has a whole video about how he does it. But the, the crux of it is super simple, which is he, cre he, he puts page numbers on it and he creates an index in the back where he'll put things that he thinks as when he finishes the page for that day, you know what, this is, this is significant. And he puts it in the index. And so it makes it easier instead of just flipping through like a hundred pages, he goes back to his index and he has what he's already decided are significant things that he journaled. And then he's got several practices where he'll go back through the week and he's got like underlining highlight, all kinds of things where I thought, I don't know if I want to do all of them because it seems a little cumbersome, but just a few things that I took out of it that I thought, I think that would help me stay with that habit of journaling because it gives me the, the, the feedback to myself right. that there's, there's value in this that I'm not, you know, it's not it's certainly not time wasted. Yeah, absolutely. And I, that's, and that's an area that if I'm being honest, I need to get better into. I don't go back and reread often, but what I have found is that when I do, especially if it's, you know, I, I've kind of have like a personal one and then I have a work, a work journal, like you can begin to see progress. Right. And the reason yeah. you stay with something for a long period of time is because you're seeing progress. Yep. And when you're journaling, if you can see like, oh, like I was journaling about this thing. And it was super, it was a stressor in my life and it's now since been resolved. And some of the things that I kind of unpacked and through journaling through that helped me make better decisions as I was navigating the situation. Then it's, then it's a kind of like a positive tick mark and positive affirmation of, Hey, do this more. So I'm going to ask you a question that is one of my favorite questions. And I learned it from someone who I didn't even know at the time there's a guy that sat down at a table for breakfast um when we were at this this training event mm. and the question is what do you know that i don't know that i wouldn't know if i didn't ask you hold on say that again <laughs> that's exactly what i said to him it's it's a question about our a blind spot right yeah what do you know that i don't know that i wouldn't know or i couldn't know if i didn't ask That is like, 
So you're asking basically what's a blind spot that I have that I need to be aware of? Not exactly. It's more like a blind spot. So uh, I'll, I'll use the example with blind spots. Like yeah. I'm aware that there's a language called Spanish. Right. right? I have a rudimentary grasp on Spanish, right? So I know that there's this language and I know that I'm not that great with it. Mm -hmm. But there are probably languages that exist out there that I'm completely unaware of, right? And if you knew that language, I would have no way of knowing it because I wouldn't even think to ask it. Gotcha. So everyone has things in their brain, not whether it's knowledge, experience. It doesn't have to be any category at all. Right. Something you, you know that I wouldn't, wouldn't even think to ask you about because I don't have an awareness. Of. Yeah, it makes me think about, so one of the ways I've heard it put is like, you know, if you draw a, cir- if you draw a circle, small circle, say this is what I know, right? And then draw a bigger circle around that. And this is what I know that I don't know. And then draw a way bigger circle around that circle and say, this is what I don't know that I don't know. Yeah, yep. okay. I'm following you. So you want me to give you something that you, yeah. that's kind of in that circle. It doesn't have to be some deep, I'm not looking for a deep, dark secret, just, it's a question that when he asked it, I literally did like a mental, like what? Yeah, you did like what I, I did just did. I was like, hold on, say that again. And then I was like, okay, exactly. here's what it is. Okay. Um, let's see. Now I've got to rack my brain. <laughs> um, Are you a big scuba diver? I'm certified. I used to be. Oh, okay. So then this I have all my funny. equipment still, except for my tank. Okay. Then that's probably not going to work. I can't believe you're certified. <laughs> I grew up in South Florida, dude. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> well, go ahead. I might not know just because I'm, I'm scuba diving before. Yeah. Uh, bon it's Air not a the, test, dude. It's supposed to be fun. <laughs> bon Air is the best place to shore dive in the world. Okay. See, I didn't know that. Bonnie. Where is that? That is off the coast of Aruba in Curacao. Well, it's like the ABC Islands. Okay. See, I didn't know that. Yeah. Most of the diving that I did because I grew up in South Florida was like just off the coast of Miami and Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, yeah, I don't, yeah. I've only had one dive that I did in the Bahamas when I went down there. Um, but this is something interesting. You, you bring that up because I moved here in 07. We're in Charlotte, North Carolina, for those watching. Yeah, sure. Um, and I'm I about here... 15 minutes away from you, by the way. <laughs> oh, okay. Pretty close, though. <laughs> yeah. So I moved here in 07, and I did not realize, I, I grew up where when you went to the beach, the water was like crystal clear. Like everywhere yeah. we went, the water was crystal clear. Here in North Carolina, when you go to the beach, it looks to me, from my perspective, like kind of muddy. Yeah. And the first couple of times I, I went to the ocean, I was like, what's going on? What's wrong with it? And they're like, what are you talking about? But it's not clear. And they're like, that's just the way it is. I, I didn't realize I was spoiled in South Florida. It's, it's all beautiful, clear, like as far as the eye can see in the water for the most part. All right. And, so, uh, so, so two things. First, Bonaire, um, best place to short dive because it's literally has to do with the continental shelf where that island is so you know i mean scuba diving you basically what you do is you get into a boat and usually you go 30 to 45 minutes to get to a wall or to get to a reef right bonaire literally has probably a couple hundred dive sites that you can access by truck and it's amazing well here's here's a twist so i joined a club i think it still exists called cayuba yes kayak and scuba together so Everybody in the club, we would do beach dives. So everybody had an kayak. Yep. We would put our equipment on the kayak. We'd paddle out to a reef. Because in Miami and Fort Lauderdale both, there's lots of reefs that are not that far off, off the, right, yeah. the shore. And we would paddle out and you just clip your equipment to the kayak. And I, I didn't believe it till I tried it. But once you clip it on, I mean, it's, it's nothing. And you would think it would be, you know, kind of heavy to, to take with you, but it's, it's no big deal. And then when you're done, you just pop up, put your equipment back on, you you paddle back to shore. It Mm -hmm. was, I mean. That sounds so fun. 
oh, it's so fun. So especially during lobster season, you get some bugs, you take them back to the beach, make a little fire, boil them up right there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. So second thing, this might be in the didn't know you didn't know this bucket, but did you know that the Outer Banks has wild horses? I want to say I thought I heard that somewhere, but I've never been. Yeah. Wild Mustangs. So my wife's family, uh, my father-in-law, mother-in-law live out there and we go out there and it's just one of the coolest things in the world. That sounds really cool. The only two beaches that I've been to are Folly Beach okay. and Oak Island. Okay. Um, so they're like Southern Shores, Kill Devil Hills area, that kind of place, like an hour and a half south of Norfolk, Virginia. I am one thing I am warming up to though is I realized that except for scuba diving, when I used to go to the beach when I lived in South Florida, I didn't really spend a lot of time in the water. Mm -hmm. For me, it was more being on the beach and all, you know, having fun on the beach. Yeah. So once I realized and thought about that, I was like, it's not that big a deal. And the beaches here are nowhere near as crowded as they are in South Florida. That is true. So, but we need to. Don't put that part on the podcast because then people will just start showing up and then they will get crowded. Oh, no. Yeah. We don't want to do like, um, I heard somebody t the other day was saying that people in Montana were complaining about the popularity of Yellowstone, like making the prices of real estate go up because people were like visiting there more and buying, buying property there. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And they're like, stop talking about it. Right. Yeah. I mean, secrets out about North Carolina in general, though, unfortunately. So. <laughs> The secret's been out. My first job out of college, one of the older guys, I think he was a manager when I was like a brand new, right out of college staff guy. And uh, he was talking about uh, buying a place in North Carolina. And I was like, why North Carolina? And he just went down you know, the, the long list of reasons why. And I was like, huh. And it always stuck in the back of my mind. And it was probably 20 plus years later when I was thinking about leaving South Florida. It was after a hurricane. And my parents had already lost everything they owned in Hurricane Andrew in 92. And then I had a bunch of damage to my condo in 05. And I was like, you know what? I want to get out of Hurricane Alley. And I started thinking about places. And Charlotte popped up because I remembered what that guy said. And when I started researching, I was like, huh? sounds like all the things he loved about it are still true. Uh, and that's, that's one of the reasons that it was at the top of my list was even that far back, I remembered that. Well, dude, we're getting to the top of the hour here. I want to respect your time. Um, tell everybody the best way to reach out to you and to get in touch with you. Absolutely. So the best way to get in touch with me is uh, LinkedIn. Uh, that's Chad Pike with a Y, P-Y-K-E. So just reach out to me on LinkedIn, send me a message, and I will be very responsive. Awesome. Awesome. I want to take a quick look. Um, I asked you... Uh, before this about your favorite quote and i'm not going to read the whole thing because it's kind of a long quote but it's, it's a long one yeah it's a teddy roosevelt quote i'm not going to ask you to to quote it or, or expect you to, to to recite it by heart but what is it about that quote that made that stand out yeah absolutely so that that quote teddy roosevelt the man in the arena uh for those of you who want to to see the full thing go look it up because it's a segment of a speech we'll, he gave we'll put a link in the show notes okay yeah, yeah yeah so so basically i'll paraphrase it's it's teddy roosevelt says it's not the critic who counts but it's the one who's in the arena whose face is marred by dirt and blood and sweat um and it's that individual basically who 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 if they fail they fail valiantly that's the worst case scenario doing something big Best case scenario is they experience wild success and achievement, but they'll never be counted with the timid souls who have never known victory or defeat. So the message behind it is, is, is engage. It's try things. Do not be afraid to fail. And even if you are failing over and over and over and over again, I think it's a better life to live trying and knowing that pain because you care than always just playing it safe and being the timid soul that never tasted defeat, but also never tasted victory. Dude, we got to end on that because I cannot top that. <laughs> thank you for your time. Um, I definitely want to have you back on. We'll figure that out down the road, but I want to thank you for your time and everybody else. We will see you next time. Thanks, John. <laughs>